kind of uh, programming in the future, which we absolutely intend to keep doing. Um, so I'm gonna just say a couple very brief words about our panelists. Um, Philip Nielsen is an assistant professor for modern history at Sarah Lawrence College in New York and an associated researcher at the Center for the History of Emotions at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin. Um, he received his PhD from Yale University in 2012. And um, we're here to talk about his book, Between Heimat and Hatred, Jews and the Right in Germany, 1871 to 1935. Um, so uh, thank you, Philip, for joining us. And we're also joined by Jay Geller, the Samuel Rosenthal Professor of Judaic Studies and Professor of History at Case Western Re Reserve University in Cleveland. Um, and he is the author, most recently, of The Sholems, a story of the German Jewish bourgeoisie from emancipation to destruction. And um, I think it will be clear how these books are, are linked um, once Jay and Philip are in discussion. And we're gonna start um, with Philip, who's gonna tell us a little bit about his book before Jay responds and then, the, and then we'll have a conversation. So Philip, take it away. Well, first of all, thank you. Thanks to the Leo Beck Institute for, for organizing this event and inviting me and Jay to be on this. Uh, thank you, David in particular, for setting it up and, and making it possible. Uh, and, and actually, even before I start, I, I wanna say that much of the research I've done actually wouldn't have been possible without the Leo Beck uh, for this book, considering that m many of the archival finds I had were either in New York uh, or in Jerusalem actually at the Leo Beck Institute there or by now have been digitized. Um, so, so in some ways, right, the, the book itself uh, is, a, is a tribute to the work uh, or the resources that the Leo Beck Institute provides. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd give a brief uh, overview over sort of the, the reasons actually for writing this book, which came out of my dissertation, um, and its structure, and um, sort of the way it works and, and raise at the end a few questions already or over the course of the way that, that I think are particularly pertinent to discuss also in conversation with Jay. Um, so the reason really for, for writing this book is that I, was, I started out with a different, with a, as often happens actually with a different topic. Um, but while I was sort of working on something really fairly unrelated about German Jewish history in the Weimar period, I kept stumbling across um, these right-wing Jews who appeared sort of on the margins uh, and sometimes sort of were also depicted as deliberately on the margins in, in sort of writing about um, German Jewry. And um, sort of I got interested in them since they kept popping up and while some were quite deliberately also themselves marginal, some of you may have or may have not have heard about Max Neumann and the Verein National Deutscher Juden, so a, a very nationalist organization that really was far off. Um, some others seem to be fairly normal um, sort of middle-class bourgeois German Jews who just happen to be very much on the right, um, or sort of center right and right. Um, and so I got interested in these choices and I think the choices that they made and also the, the work they had to put into um, creating that identity um, and the question to at what point this work and this choice really became almost overwhelming, right? Until when something like that of being a Jew on the right could be a fairly normal position or was an entirely controversial. Um, and at what point really became something of an outlier, both for Jews and, and non-Jews um, alike. Um, and so right, you, you see where this is going in the context also with the Sholems. One of the characters actually is Weinhold Scholem, um, who appears uh, in my book much more briefly than he does in, in Jay's works, obviously. Uh, but here too, right, we have one brother who, who picks a particular position. Um, I don't want to by no means sort of give the impression that these were a large group. There were a minority among German Jews. Um, sort of voting behavior and political orientation of Jews in Germany precisely sort of hard to judge, even though it's gotten better um, over time. But as early as 1966, Jacob Turi in his work sort of estimated uh, that around 10%, maybe in the Weimar Republic, between 5 and 10 would be voting sort of center, right, and right position parties. And, and I think that that's about right, right? Like so if we talk about maybe 10%, so a small minority, but not, not, a, not a fringe minority um, either um, as, at that. Uh, what I describe sort of as on the right then, um, and that might be a matter of, of definition that are in order, 
um, are Jews who were by and large sort of non-democratic or for, for not for democratic politics. There could be royalist or monarchist, so there could be fairly conservative on that end. Um, there could be initially sort of pro-parliament, but not necessarily democracy in, in the empire, sort of national liberals, um, who then found or may not have found their peace with the Weimar Republic. And they were organized in various um, sort of overlapping fields. And that's roughly how I look at it in my book. Uh, it's chronological, um, but and I look over these these five chapters that I wrote um, at the fields of one sort of state service, being military or um, civil, something I call sort of the the settlement movement or back to land movement. So the the, the an, an engagement with the redeeming factors of working on the land, which uh, from the beginning was complicated both by its very clear defense against anti-Semitic stereotypes, at the same time driven by sort of a bourgeois romanticism of, of the German earth or soil, uh, and hinted sort of at organic uh, notions of belonging rather than sort of pluralistic or democratic. Um, but it also overlapped to um, with sort of Zionist um, sort of ideals about working the soil and working the land, though obviously with quite different ideas about whether it would lead for German Jewry. Um, then the question of sort of cultural attachment um, and religion and how sometimes conservative religious orientation could lead them also into the characters I'm looking at, into a um, sort of politically conservative orientation. And um, finally, sort of the question of particularly German my, speaking minorities in the East and more generally sort of a regional Heimat attachment um, that could lead to associational links um, with more conservative groups or groups that over time became more conservative. So that's another part of the story. Not all of the fields I'm looking at are necessarily off the right from the beginning, um, but can become so over time or vice versa, kind of can start out as something fairly conservative and, and over time become more liberal. Um, so there's a, there's a question of development here too. Um, and I follow in this of sort of a cast of around 300 people that I found in the archives, 12, right? So that's, that's give or take, 10, 10 to 12 people. Um, mostly men, so I think actually something Jane I may talk about later too is the question of gender um, in this. And I have my own sort of theory about why that is that sort of I ended up with a mostly male cast um, that are spread out fairly evenly over um, Germany. So there's, there's, but though there is a question of regionalism it's particularly regional attachment here to four different experiences. Um, so for example, coming back from the First World War, the experience of two German military rabbis who served on the Eastern Front with fairly positive experiences, surprisingly, maybe or not. Um, their post-war experience and one going back to Württemberg, um, close to actually ending up close to Stuttgart, and one in the Southwest of Germany and one in Bremen is vastly different in terms of how they then experience it, right? Sort of the, the local uh, setting can also even in the same social demographic group um, can be very different in the sort of shaping how anti-Semitism and their reaction to it um, plays out. And um, sort of in that, again, sort of the question of, particularly when we go into Weimar, uh, so I, start, I started, I thought I would start with Weimar. Uh, in the end, I realized I had to go backwards um, because there was sort of a generational divide also among the people I looked at um, into the Weimar, into the, sorry, into the empire and here, sort of going then to the Weimar period, you'll get sort of other divisions between old and new, right, that mirror also um, sort of the non-Jewish German political development. Um, so sort of going into Weimar again, this question of choice, when something is still normal, no longer normal, when something that may have been a default choice earlier does no longer become a default choice is a question. What I overall contend really is that, and that's not particularly controversial, uh, so sort of that the First World War obviously is a defining um, experience and the rise of anti-Semitism after, but particularly then um, actually the, the period of stabilization when for conservative organizations or organizations on the right that may have defined themselves before sort of um, not exclusively um, along sort of nationalist line, but sort of along state-centric lines or other, now have to be contend with a definition of the people. And then in order to defend themselves or defend, not defend themselves, differentiate themselves from, from the Republic, often depicted as right, the true Republic, they then adopt openly anti-Semitic over Aryan paragraphs that beforehand had may have been implicit, but still allowed for a certain 
um, sort of openness towards Jewish human rights. So if you think about the two main nationalist organization, the German National People's Party or the Stahlhelm, which is the right wing uh, veterans organization, both of them adopt Ar so-called Aryan paragraphs in the mid 1920s, 24 and 26 respectively, but not already 1918. So really this middle period, um, ironically period of civilization, I, I see for most of my characters as something that's very defining in terms of when, when a choice becomes no longer um, sort of an unproblematic choice or very quite clearly not a problem, unproblematic choice anymore. Um, so I follow these, these, this cast of characters all the way until 1935 um, and then have a brief epilogue um, afterwards of so the afterlives. And here too, uh, Jay has done this much more um, sort of eloquently in his book, but I think the question of actually what happens after and what kind of um, German identity and Mike as a political identity these characters retain, uh, choose to retain, do not retain following emigration um, is sort of a question that I find quite interesting. And again, speaks to um, this issue of political choice, but also the performance of political choices and to what extent you, you maintain something even in adversity, um, which by all accounts at that point as a political project has ended in failure. Um, but nonetheless, what do you do then with it um, afterwards? What's the afterlife, so to speak, of these um, choices? So that's bro really broad strokes, right? The overview of story that stretched from the 1880s until the 1930s um, covers, again, sort of four different fields, more or less from veteran politics to religion of resettlement um, and uh, state service. And has its own sort of varieties depending on regional, not regional affiliation, and is a mostly male story. Um, and so I leave it at that for now and let's sort of Jay de de define the terms of the discussion much better than I could do. Thanks. Well, first I'd like to thank the Leo Beck Institute for hosting this event and Philip for the conversation. Um, when Philip was working on this book when it came out, I, I was you know, thinking about his topic and as well as my own book. And something that was really on my mind as I wrote my book about the Sholem family is how representative is this, is this story I'm telling? And when we think about Jews voting for right of center parties in particularly the Weimar Republic, you know, one can say, well, this perhaps isn't terribly representative. And yet I'm so pleased that this book is out. It's a great book, which I would encourage all our, our everyone joining us today to, to take a look at, because it's a story that, that needed to be told. It's a, it's a fascinating story about a, a really interesting and meaningful segment of the German Jewish political community that often gets overlooked, in fact. I think that people often discount them, and I think it's done too easily. Um, I'd like to relate an episode from my own book uh, that may shed some light on, on this phenomenon as well. In, January 1919, Germany had elections for a national assembly, what we would call in American parlance, a constitutional convention. It would be Betty Scholem's first time voting ever. She was 52 years old. Germany had just extended suffrage to women a few weeks earlier after the revolution of 1918. There was no doubt that in this election, Betty Scholem would vote for the German Democratic Party. The German Democrats were the left liberal or progressive political party in Germany. And most German Jews voted for them during the Weimar Republic. Almost immediately after the revolution, Betty enthusiastically announced her intention to join the party. And in later elections, she even convinced her, her non-Jewish household help to vote for the German Democrats. And part of what I argue in my book is that voting for this party and generally identifying with it is part of what made a middle-class German Jew a middle-class German Jew, except for when it wasn't. And even though the majority of German Jews voted left liberal, a significant and intriguing minority did not. And they're largely the subject of Philip's book. Now, it's tempting to assume that German Jews' voting patterns can be linked to their socioeconomic status, uh, middle-class, upper class or working class, and that that might inform absolutely their voting. And, and it did to some degree, but taking that as the sole delimiter of voting patterns would really be oversimplifying things to the point that we ignore some interesting cases. And the Sholem family is one of those cases. Betty Sholem had four sons, Reinhold, Erich, Werner, and Gerhard, who 
later became known as Gershom. And even though they were raised in the same house under identical economic and cultural circumstances, uh, they ended up taking four different political paths. Erich, the second oldest, voted for the German Democrats, the most progressive non-socialist political party and strong supporters of the Weimar Republic's democracy. So he voted for the same party as his mother and the majority of German Jews in this time period. Gershom became a Zionist. He rejected his parents' world of German assimilation, and he sought an identity that he considered to be exclusively Jewish. He made Aliyah in 1923, and he went on to become a very famous Israeli intellectual. Werner went in the opposite direction in rejecting his parents' world. Rather than becoming particularistic, he became universalistic. He joined the Socialist Party, the Social Democratic Party of Germany before the war, and he became a communist a few years after the war. And he had a very brief but spectacular career within the German Communist Party. The oldest brother was Reinhold. And again, Philip has written a bit about him in his book. As early as 1919, Reinhold joined the National Liberal German People's Party. And he, he strongly identified with this party, as we can see in his, his letters to his brother, Gershom. What motivated a middle-class Jew like Reinhold to join a political party that was actually ambivalent about the fight against anti-Semitism? Well, this was a man who served as the platoon leader and later a lieutenant in the World War. I, I don't want to overdetermine his case. There were plenty of Jews who served as officers who did not join the German People's Party, uh, including Bernhard Weiss, the deputy chief of police in, in Berlin. But Reinhold definitely had a sense of himself as a German, as well as a Jew. He was a member of the Central Association of German Citizens of the Jewish Faith, and the name itself is somewhat telling, right? The Central Association of German Citizens of the Jewish Faith. He wasn't shy about noting that he was a lieutenant in the Army Reserve, at least in 1918, 1919. During the 1920s, and really throughout his life, he did not regard Germanness and Jewishness, his Germanness and his Jewishness in contradiction. And he would not accept that others would see them as mutually exclusive. In this, he is wholly part of the world that Philip explores. Now, to be clear, this wasn't the majority of the Jewish community in Germany, but it was a notable minority. Moreover, if we're talking about so-called national liberal Jews, such as Reinhold, they were not beyond the pale or outside the tent of the community, the way, say, Werner Scholl the communist brother was. They were even operating within a long-standing German Jewish tradition. One thing that Philip explores for his readers is why these Jews came to the political choices they did. I don't want to give away all of Philip's analysis. Instead, I would encourage you to read his book. But for someone like Reinhold Scholem, I can't help but think it was a combination of factors. One was certainly class consciousness. After all, Reinhold was an independent businessman. And throughout his life, he inclined to liberal economics. This is true in the 47 years in which he lived in Germany and in the 47 years in which he lived in Australian emigration or exile. We can discuss that uh, during the conversation. But also part of it was an opposition to, really even a disdain for the Marxist drift of German politics in 1918 and 1919, uh, spearheaded by um, uh, coffee house socialists or salon communists, as he put it. In English, we might call these people champagne socialists or limousine liberals. But as Philip points out, we can't discount the experience of the war. For many Jews, the war highlighted discrimination. And we see this in the experience of some of the Sholem brothers. But for others, it was a treasured moment of belonging, both to the nation and to the common cause. And that feeling did not cease after 1918 at least not for them, 
even if it did for many non-Jewish Germans. So there are many points of intersection between my book and Philip's, most particularly in, in the person of Reinhold Scholem, but also in the German Jewish space that he inhabited or that he imagined to be possible for Jews like him. So I'll leave it there as a brief introduction. And um, I'd like to discuss with Philip some aspects of his book that really stood out for me that I felt lent themselves to, to greater exploration. So the subtitle of the book is Jews and the Right. And when you're talking about Jews right of center, I mean, you're really talking about different groups. There are conservatives, there are right liberals, there are national liberals, some are monarchists, which I thought was a fascinating phenomenon. Some are inclined to parliamentarianism, at least parliamentarianism after a certain fashion. So how did these groups on the right interact? How did they regard each other? Did they see themselves as having common cause or not? Are we talking about different distinct groups? So did some look farther to the right and some look more to the center for interlocutors? Yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely right in, the, in sort of highlighting really the disparity um, of, of the field here also, sorry, of uh, right, what it means to be off the right. And this actually was one of the things of matters of definition of how would I call it, right? And on the right sort of was this, it's almost sort of catch-all um, phrase uh, to bring these very disparate sort of orientations that were on the whole sort of anti-democratic at the very least, sometimes we say parliamentarian, but not democratic. Um, so not for the entire sort of popular franchise, uh, but for still a class-based voting systems so or certain belief in elitist functions. Um, there, they, some of them overlapped and some of them didn't. So I think um, why I came also to this notion of fields is sort of to look at certain um, field of practical, not practical politics necessarily, but sort of because they're not all political in a narrow sense, but of social organization, um, where you can find also uh, these different people, sometimes together, sometimes not, but they sometimes felt, find themselves in the same um, circles. So to give a concrete example, um, and sometimes with more than just liberal politicians, right? So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the other, uh, more than just, sorry, right of center politicians. Um, so to give an example, um, to go back to this question of, of settlement in the soil, maybe. Um, which, which started out sort of in, in 1897, um, this uh, Bodenkulturverein or the Association for the Strengthening of the Connection of German Jews to the Soil. Uh, it was established in Berlin. It was a fairly grand affair, um, right? Where, so this was a who is who of Berlin society um, that was there. And at that point, it was really from Zionists to liberals to conservatives with their different agendas um, in there. So you could find someone um, who, like Otto Warburg, who really sort of ultimately imagined something like that in the settlement of uh, Palestine to someone who really thought this had to be a settlement venture for Germany and German soil, right? So that was the thing. Uh, mostly then in the end for Eastern European Jewish immigrants who would become German through this labor. As it becomes German and more sort of um, contested in the end of so the Zionist leave and the, the course uh, sort of early in, just before the war and the war. And then after the war, um, it gets reestablished in a slightly different fashion. Um, and at that point, it is very much or more at least immediately a thing off the right where you find old conservatives who construe this sort of as a state building venture and think of it in older traditions and hark back to ideas about uh, the Prussian Settlement Commission and see that sort of as an effort really to keep certain areas also German. So that's their imaginary space, right? But they interact with people who come out of the war and think for example of the settlement of veterans, right? And think about um, them as part of a, the frontline community. Um, they can coalesce around a certain idea of an organic notion of the state, but where they, or the, the, the people, right, uh, that isn't driven necessarily by immediate liberal political rights, uh, and they're, they're acting in this field, but they, how they arrive there is from different um, directions, right, so that's uh, one example, or you find them sort of in veterans organizations, similarly, right, kind of different um, notions of what of the right means uh, can coalesce for, for a time being, right, in specific actions of commemoration, for example. Um, but precisely those, those differences then sometimes break into the open, um, particularly when it comes, well, both for how you react in the longer term to the Weimar Republic, 
right? Where, where a certain sort of a state centrism sometimes actually a, a allows for a certain compromise with it, where um, sort of a more, more ideological um, opposition to it doesn't, even though sort of that is there really in the Jewish case, that's more common in the sort of non-Jewish and political case. That's why you also see a split between the non-Jewish and Jewish right positions that are possible developing. Um, and you see it um, then in sort of imagining what a future might look like. And that's really very much sort of a generational split um, at that point. So there, fields where, where they interact, um, if they happen to be in the same regions, and maybe this is talking about sort of regional experiences or something else we should talk to. But so, yeah, so they, they remain disparate, but sometimes there are points of contact in certain projects that they engage in. Defense of Germany in the East would be another one. So it seems that some of these Jews on the right arrive at their conservatism uh, through culture, specifically German culture, of course. Others, it's economic. Um, some also arrive there through religion. Can you talk more about the role of religion as a motivator for, for conservative or right of center Jews? And I think it's very interesting. It's almost telling that two of the, of the major figures in your book are, of course, rabbis. And they are, um, right, they're not the only, the only sort of religiously motivated figures. And I want to say briefly that all the people I, all, all sort of the protagonists of my book are, um, I see I have to talk louder. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to talk louder and maybe move a bit closer to the microphone. Um, all the, the protagonists of the note regarded themselves in, in some or another way, well, belonging to the Jewish community, right? So I didn't, I didn't look at converts or uh, Germans of Jewish descent, um, even though right, they, they would have often be perceived by the non-Jewish out, German outside also as Jewish. But what I was interested in really was sort of uh, to see how sort of self-identifying Jews could also be self-identifying conservative, right? So, uh, so there's a certain, if that always means they needed to be properly religious is a different story, right? But there's some involvement sort of Jewish traditions or Jewish community and Jewish culture broadly conceived. Um, but for the conservatism, right? I mean, there's a longer tradition in that than even um, in, the, well, in, in the empire, uh, sort of the, the organ of, of orthodoxy, right? The newspaper, the Israel elite, um, even in response to the Tivoli program, still sort of essentially, which is uh, the first prop, like openly anti-Semitic political program of a, of a party in the empire, which is a conservative party, um, that still endorses sort of that as better than sort of some version of liberalism sometimes, right? Sort of that as orthodox voters should still stick to that because overall the worldview of a conservative um, state that is in some ways religious, right? Sort of, and, and respects the role of religion in the public sphere, but in this instance, Christianity is preferable to secularism, not to speak of Marx, like the Marxist variety of that. And that to some extent is also the reason for some of the reliances in, in, in Weimar, right? So the defense of religion in the public sphere, uh, of religious schooling, of sort of school laws, that, that also divides, for example, the left liberal and the right liberal, so the DFLP and the DDP, the progressive Democrats and the um, sort of German People's Party when it comes to school politics in Weimar and the question of religious schooling as default schooling. Um, and here sort of the attempt to defend the role of religion in public life against the perceived or real uh, sort of threat by the Republic um, brings some people to the right then. And, and for example, in Bavaria um, creates a fairly strong alliance between the, the, the Catholic People's Party there, so the, the, the offshoot in Bavaria of the center party, which you know, was part of the Weimar coalition, but the, the Bavarian branch is really not particularly liberal. I mean, it's a, it's a fairly conservative uh, thing. So, but there's strong relations with that over the fence of that. Um, and sometimes it also integrates them, and that goes to the question to the rabbis, right? There are certain figures of already in the empire, you know, of the, of the local elite, the conservative elite sometime, and you see that with one example, Aaron Tenza, um, right, he's, he's part uh, of all these associations and associational life in Göppingen uh, with, you know, the national liberal mayor and these people, and at some point he starts to campaign against um, sort of dirty literature, as they call it, right? like the Schundliteratur, because that's sort of not something that uh, which very much again sort of becomes an issue of the right uh, as time goes on. 
Um, so, so that's one reason where really religion just sort of the, 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 the space of religion and public life sort of forges uh, certain alliances. For some, I mean, again, so I'm not going to say this is the majority stance for all things, but in Bavaria, Neumeyer is the head of the Bavarian sort of Israelite community. Uh, and he has these very strong working relationships at some point, even with Faulhaber, right? Sort of the, the cardinal. Yeah. You know, the war is a central um, point of analysis or moment in, you know, in, in, your, in your book. And I can't help but think that there is this, it, 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 it marks this great schism. Those um, uh, that there, you, you, you mentioned the generational shift, the generational divide in your opening remarks. And I can't help but think that there are those German Jews right of center who still hold on to the, the, the frontalness versus those who, for whom this is only stories they hear and it's an imagined space. So can, can you tease out a little more for us this generational divide as we move past the world war into the next generation that doesn't have a living memory of the, the frontalness of the war or even this national liberal experience from the Kaiserreich. Yeah, even though the generation of the so the divide is even more complicated, right? Because you have the ones that have the experience, right, you refer to the national liberal experience of the Kaiserreich, who don't serve in the war. So they don't have actually the frontal lipness, but they're you know, at the home front or, or continuing in some sort of state service. Wow. Then you have sort of this middle generation that's been socialized to some extent, at least in the Kaiserreich, then has the front experience sometimes positive, sometimes negative. And then you have the generation after that's born, right, so the, the famous uh, later, um, how's it called, the, the, the generation of the radicals, right, that Werner best uh, generation, um, who don't have any experience of the, neither of the Kaiserreich, nor really of the First World War, but sort of come of age in the 1920s, and that's the formative point of reference um, for them. And so um, you have these three, roughly sort of these three different experiences. One, the first one that stays very much sort of state centric and one example for that sort of remains in service and maybe sort of begrudging the um, sort of the, the slow republicanization of state service uh, in the Weimar Republic and Prussia, right? And really um, hold on to what they refer to as a, an apolitical stance, right? Apolitical always means that everyone who was not of the so-called state supporting parties of the empire, which of course was a political stance too, but of the left or was the social Democrats, the center party, right? The ones who weren't allowed in state service now come into state service, right? So they have a certain big grudge against that. That's one generation. Zlatanow, for example. Zlatanow, for example. But Zlatanow, cousin of Walter Zlatanow, um, who's in the Prussian Ministry of the Interior and they're responsible for the politics regarding uh, sort of German speaking minorities uh, in the Prussian borders interesting task in and of itself. Uh, then, then you have the generation of someone like, for example, Tenza or one person I was called Fritz Grunwald, who's an, an officer in the, um, on the Western Front actually uh, during the First World War and comes back from, from the, the Rhineland um, and mostly sort of has a positive, positive memory of, you know, being slightly being of this elite version of the front experience too. So he begrudges really the revolution and then the Republic for taking away what he seems as this decorative service, right? Sort of that being of a soldier or officer caste who finally made it. Um, he doesn't necessarily bear any nostalgia for the empire, but he has a nostalgia for the front service and tries to defend this. And that kind of, um, that's what I meant in my opening remarks as the work that goes into it, right? It's fairly natural at the beginning of the 20s and becomes ever harder to maintain also that fiction um, as non-Jewish veterans associations of the right at least continue to cooperate in certain moral services but, but also become more clearly anti-Semitic, right? Sort of that, uh, and there's this always this fight for but we are part of this front generation. The Reichsbund Jüdischer Frontsoldaten, right? Is, is sort of a prime example for that even though the membership is much more very politically, but sort of in a time of the space of creating that. Um, and the last one is the one born after, which neither has great adherence to the front erlebnis or born before, but not with no experience of the war. And sort of embraces then, well, what, I don't know, what we would call the conservative revolution, right? Sort of, I think at some point, okay, liberal ideas have, have outlived themselves. So that idea of sort of civic rights that our forefathers hold on to as a mode of emancipation is in there. Um, the front soldier experience may be one template, 
but are really looking looking for other norms of social organization. And that Hans Joachim Schöps is one example of for that. Uh, but he's not. I mean, he might. He's in some ways a bit of an outlier overall. Again, but even someone quite like well Anna, sorry, but I think he's quite well known as well. He's very well known, exactly, um, and, and sort of well read and received at the not received, but well known, well connected. So he's not sort of position might be a bit more extreme, but he, he's not sort of an outcast by any means. But even someone like Anna Herzberg, who's the head of the youth wing of the Zentralverein that you mentioned earlier, he too by thirty two is of the opinion that. You know, liberalism really has seen as they, and we have to think of other political organizations. And he thinks of corp, sort of a corporatist state, right? He doesn't, and that token for him is not a shift to the left, which others do, but sort of a, yeah, another notion of what an organic, the organized state might look like. Um, that isn't too far away from what others are like, sort of non Jewish right at that point embrace too of the same generation. You know, thinking about the Scholem family, they undergo some of these, these uh, fractures within the family around 1930, 1932, that uh, the uncle Theobald Scholem, who is an old Zionist, actually tries to get his family to vote for the Zentrumspartei, for the Catholic Center Party. Also thinking if liberalism, liberal democracy has outlived its utility, if its day has passed, we need to cast our lot with a different group and it's not going to be the Social Democrats. And again, these are, middle-class bourgeois German Jews. And so they too are thinking the Catholic center party, which again, this is now the era of Ludwig Klaas. And this is, you know, they're, they're also thinking people who are liberal, but are now thinking almost post-liberal. Yeah. Um, and some, I mean, since you're speaking of 32, uh, there's this almost, I mean, at that point really, the, the choices or the positions that the people I look at a hold are becoming, even more tragic than they may have been sometimes already before. But there's this last ditch effort to actually get the German National People's Party, right? The party that adopted a so-called Aryan paragraph in, 19, in the mid 1920s um, to let them back in, in a way, sort of the Jews in, 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 in a show of, you know, we are so, we are the real conservatives and we can really bring you votes and have so many acquaintances who would vote for the German National People's Party. You get these letters that are written to them, but as a sign kind of, of what the political space for these conservative Jews is at this point, the, the People Party officials, the National People Party officials think it's a, it's sort of, it's a conspiracy by the Nazis and they're being set up uh, as seemingly close to the Jews. Um, and so don't really know what to do with it. They can't even take that as face value anymore that these are really Jews who are writing to them and they might not want to have them, but they think it's sort of a political plot of their enemies on the right. Yeah, in your book, you have this, this episode that's, I mean, it's almost comical, certainly tragically comical, about a German Jew who wants to join the German National People's Party, and they're not aware that he's Jewish. And then when they find out, they, they ask him to resign. And you know, for someone like whose worldview is structured around a sense of shared, um, a shared community, shared notion of Germanness, this, is, this, this, you know, surely must have been devastating, if not just merely, you know, just disillusioning at a, at a very profound level. Though for him, I mean, he, I have him in there because he's sort of, he, he's very good also for the response to like to show what kind of, I'm always, I was always struck when I was reading his letters, how he could have been so oblivious to that, right? Because he actually then, he, he, he complains, right? When he gets the, because the, the way it comes out that he's Jewish, is that he complains about an anti-Semitic reaction of someone in the party to him after he has joined, which really, I mean, if you, maybe he's never read the party program, he's never, right. so how he came to join that party and then sort of thinks that they will defend him against anti-Semitism within it, so sort of is mind boggling. But nonetheless, right, sort of he does it and then the party reacts. Uh, they are more aware of that they're anti-Semitic, but nonetheless try to join, right, and nonetheless say, look, anti-Semitism really shouldn't be all important. And what they look to actually at this point um, is Italy, right, sort of, I mean, in, in, a, in an attempt to understand what's going on and where, where sort of, German politics might be developing in a post-liberal age, right? That seems to be dawning by the 1930s. Um, trying to understand sort of Mussolini and fascism there is for some of them sort of a way to think, okay, maybe there is, you know, there's some all this anti-Semitism right now, but maybe there's some space for me, right? Maybe it doesn't have to be necessarily anti-Semitic uh, what is happening. I might find my place in this new, even post, like immediately post 30th of January 33, um, there might be a space for us. You know, thinking back to the Bodenkulturverein, there's this very curious paradox, and I know you're aware we've discussed this before, 
um, this paradox in, in that conservative groups want the Jews to prove their Germanness by returning to the land, while the Zionists, who see the Jews as distinct from the Germans ethno-nationally, also want the Jews to return to the land and receive agricultural training. And they have this brief moment, not at perhaps institutionally, but a you know, level of individuals of intersection and collaboration. Can you speak a little bit about this, this paradox that's at work here, the strange uh, phenomenon? It is, and I think, I mean, that's a, it's sort of, it, it's, it comes out of the shared sort of romanticization of the soil, right? Sort of lurking on the land. I mean, you can look to Nada and any like number of people on various spectrums, right? Sort of non-Jewish and Jewish who at that point embrace, right? This return um, to the soil from the ills of the modern city and city life and embrace it. And, they've, and the practices are often very, very similar, right? I mean, sort of what they'll do on those farms. And actually, in the beginning, it is institutional, right? Actually, shared. So the Bodenkulturverein, as I said, has both Zionists and non-Zionists among its members. Um, when they fall out of, with each other, there's precisely that different angle, right? Because at some point, the question is: so we have this first generation of trainees, um, like farmers, who now need to find gainful employment. Um, and the Zionists, of course, want them to be actually not necessarily emigrate right now. That is sort of not, not even what they're pushing for, but be on a Jewish farm, right? The so Jewish farm. They're not that many, right? So they're not that many to start with. So that's that's a limited employment opportunity. Also, generally at an age of like agricultural crises. I mean, this all happens on the background really of urbanization and not sort of a return to the land. I mean, that makes it even more quixotic. Um, whereas the the non-Zionist members saying, no, no, it's perfect actually if, if these trainees work on non-Jewish farms, because that can really show those non-Jews that they've become properly German and kind of uh, mitigate all these, or sort of counter all these anti-Semitic stereotypes. And at that point, they break apart, because then sort of the, the, that, that is where even the practices and the idea about the benefits of working on the, on the land uh, and, and sort of the practices of the soil can still be bridged, whether it then be sort of German soil or soil that happens to be in Germany um, is, is that no longer, like, that's, that's where they part ways. But in terms of, I mean, there's an irony really, almost sometimes on a personal level, so I've got Neumeyer, who mentioned before, is the head of the, the Bavarian Israelite uh, sort of community, as it's called in the 20s. He's one of the founding members also of, the, uh, of a settlement venture in the 20s, and he's involved in it before, of a very much non-Zionist variety, right? So he's, he's very much for the fact that it's the two sort of shows the, the connection to the land. Um, but he eventually then is saved right, by the fact that his son trains on a Hachara, um, so an immigration uh, estate and, and managed to emigrate to Argentina and then bring his father uh, and his mother over um, in, in 40, 41, they did, I mean, really in the, in, the, uh, in the nick of time at the very end, but sort of where uh, the, the kind of settlement venture he's been sort of fighting for most of his life is then the one that really, that really saves him. You're considering that this is, broadly speaking, an unusual political choice for Jews in Germany in this era. I mean, at what point does this atypical political choice become normalized? Um, how does the, the broader Jewish community view it? And then at what point does the broader Jewish community then communicate that this formally acceptable choice is no longer acceptable, that it's become too peculiar or even antithetical to, to their best interests? I think sort of in the beginning, and, and as you mentioned sort of with the, with the Sholems, I think sort of, and, and the long tradition of sort of national liberals uh, in, in, in national liberal Jews, I mean, which ends at some point, right? I mean, there's a break until the eight, late 1870s. So there's the Jewish members even in parliament of that party, and then sort of essentially it becomes more, not necessarily anti-Semitic, but formally anti-Semitic, but certainly has fewer Jewish representation. It's a fairly normal choice, I think, sort of going in like unification and, and after, right? Sort of at that point, being being somewhat of the on the right and for various reasons um, within the fold of political options available to German Jews is not particularly remarkable, right? Um, then in the 1890s, sort of it becomes a bit more normal or more widespread to be on the progressive spectrum. Um, as there is also the sort of conservative backlash uh, at the late 18, like 70s, early 1880s in the German Empire. And you see, for example, that certain avenues that you thought might have opened up for you in state service, et cetera, particularly in the Prussian one, uh, 
close off again. Um, so the military, for example, so that like that route of emancipation isn't quite as clear uh, as as you may have assumed. There's a shift sort of then I think would say to, to the center left more, um, but nonetheless, so it stays. So being maybe not full on conservative, but at someone on the right and a monarchist too, I mean, it's not, it's, it's not super unknown. And you see Monarchary Kutsusheim, who's a, who becomes an, uh, you know, what is called an Orientalist scholar, uh, scholar of the Orient in the Munich, Munich University in the twenties and actually uh, is a teacher of, of Gershom Scholem briefly. Um, so he, his brother is a so, social Democrat, his brother-in-law is a social Democrat and his, his brother is a um, sort of liberal. Um, and clearly, and he's he's a sort of self about royalist, and but like royalist in the sense like he's he's a Wittelsbach person. Right, he's a Bavarian royalist, and I think that yeah, he's a Bavarian royalist. He's, he's not, a, and he's very specifically right a Bavarian royalist. Um, and that is clearly in his family how it describes an interaction with the extended family, the the much more normal choice that comes through sort of in diaries and letters. Whereas, so the liberal brother also is, is okay, even though he leaves then the community, which is seen as sort of a bit fishy. Um, but it's the social democrat brother who sticks out, right, in, in, in the, in the 1900, 1910s, right? Um, and then, so, so at that point, I think that is more normal. And then in the 20s, as the 20s progressed, right, and really sort of the shift, not even immediately post First World War, I want to say, but in the mid 1920s, then going forward slowly, right, these positions become more complicated again, as it is clear that on the right, anti Semitism really hardens. Um, and, the, the liberal the shares of the liberal parties decline. I mean, as, as long as Schreisemann is around, sort of the DVP remains sort of a legitimate choice. Um, but sort of by the late 1920s, there are big discuss discussions, as you know, well, now sort of in the Zentralverein then too, um, over to what extent the Social Democrats might not be the best option as the strongest defenders um, against anti Semitism, regardless of maybe the sometimes distasteful class politics they have. So I, want, I know that there are many people who want to ask us questions. But, um, so I just want to give, have one final question for our discussion. And it's something that you alluded to in your opening remarks. It's, it's a theme late in my book as well, which is the afterlife of German Jewish identity. I mean, it's remarkable how many right of center German Jews, such as Reinhold Scholem, continue to hold on to notions or illusions as Gershom would have said about his brother but these notions of German Jewishness and really Germanness in their years and emigration. So what do you make of that? And how does it manifest itself with the cast of characters that you looked at? Um, right, I looked at sort of the afterlife then of these 10, 10 people who live shorter or longer life sort of post um, Holocaust. I wanna say only one of them actually returns, right? Only Hans Joachim Scheps really returns to uh, Germany, many others stay abroad, though they do at least three or four of them. And again, I'm only speaking of this narrow group, begin at least to forge relationships with their um, home countries again. And in them, and I think maybe most obviously in their memoirs, right, they try to retain um, something of that German and they defend it too. I mean, some of them are more aware of the fact that it really is a project that failed. Um, and, and so sort of try to come to grips with their own choices, but others are, are not, right? Like for others that is still Neumeyer, for example, Fritz Neumeyer, um, writing during the war, right? Sort of is still, um, then afterward decides not to come back, but strongly defends like all his work for, you know, right of center politics because he felt that was the right thing to do. And every once in a while he let it slip that maybe that may have been a mistake, but he tries to convince himself actually otherwise that that is true. And I think that, so to some extent that of course is the nature of memoirs, right? You try to make sense of your life. Um, and, and so some of them try to defend sort of their choices here uh, and, and write that into them. But um, yeah, if you, if as a really from the mid 1920s on, but even before, right? You, you had to, some, to some extent, perform even in growing adversity, sort of that kind of German patriotism that you keep continue to perform it even after emigration. Um, if in some ways not so surprising, right? In Reinhold's yeah. correspondence with, with Gershom, and so Gershom is writing from Jerusalem and other venues where he, he's doing research and living, and Reinhold's writing from Sydney, Australia. 
And there is, I, I had the sense that there was something strongly performative uh, going on with Reinhold's self-presentation of himself as still German. And he says he will not let Hitler tell him what it meant to be German. And I, I don't doubt that he felt that uh, mm -hmm. sincerely. At the same time, there has to be something performative about this as his brother is so heavily and so publicly saying that the, you know, the German Jewish symbiosis was an illusion, uh, that Jews like Reinhold were, were simply deluding themselves, setting themselves up. And then of course he writes his memoir from Berlin to Jerusalem, which has this almost as a, as a, a, a thread, thread throughout, throughout the book. So yeah, I, I agree with you that there is the performative aspect as well as it, it's, it's genuinely held. In the case of Reinhold, what's interesting is that he joins the Australian Liberal Party and finds himself on the right edge of the Australian Liberal Party. And so his Germanness, which may or may not be performative and, general, and I think is genuinely held, is accompanied by a real sense of right-wing politics and a sort of socioeconomic sense also outside of Germany, that there's this marriage of the two of them in Germany that, uh, that finds a, a different sort of expression abroad. I was actually struck by that sort of by Reinhardt and then the experience of Erich, right? That sort of, on, on the other hand, I would have sort of expected someone on the previous directory of their two lives that maybe Erich would have an easier time as he also rejects sort of uh, his German identity much more strongly, right? So to fit into um, or build up an Australian identity, and he, maybe you can say a bit more about it, seems to really struggle, whereas Reinhold sort of fairly comfortably, maybe for, you know, socioeconomic reasons too, then as he's more successful, is both sort of has an Australian life, but is much more uncomplicated sort of in his connection to, to Germany post-war. Post yeah, when Eric, Eric had a very complicated life in Australia. I mean, first of all, he left his first wife uh, basically as he left Germany and uh, immigrated with the woman who had become his second wife and, and married. And both his first wife and he remarried shortly after arriving in Australia. He had a very difficult time finding a profession. He bounced around from various business ventures. He had several bouts of cancer. He finally died in 1965, whereas Reinhold lived until 1985. So I think that he never really was at home. I think that his rejection of Germanists, while certainly um, strongly felt and legitimately felt, was also a reaction to the fact that he lost a secure life in Germany in exchange for the, the an ongoing insecurity. Turbulent personal life, he had poor relations with some of, some of his kids off and on, with his brothers off and on, and then uh, economically, never really quite finding his place in Australia. Whereas, you know, as you put it, Reinhold had the, the less complicated experience. And so it's somewhat bewildering that this man, even in the 1970s, can say, well, I, I'm a German. I'm not gonna let anyone tell me I'm not a German. I, you know, I wonder if, if his own personal life had been different if he would have said the same thing. Of course, there's no way of knowing. Well, I, th I think um, we should get to the audience questions, but thank you um, for a really fascinating discussion. Um, is just following the the, key, the questions that have been typed into the Q and A field. It seems like people have um, are really interested in talking about uh, sort of contemporary parallels and, and Jewish political affiliations. Um, so um, maybe be prepared to comment on that in a minute. But I want to sort of stay in the past, uh, at least for the first question. Um, and we have a question from Michael Friedman about um, uh, something that you alluded to, but maybe could go a little bit deeper into is the sort of role of, of class in all this. And um, Michael, do you want to um, uh, pose your question on the air, so to speak? Are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Oh, hi, Michael, go ahead. Hi, so I was just, uh, I was struck that both of you in your discussions only marginally alluded to the socioeconomic affiliations of the uh, of the Jewish right wing figures, who are undoubtedly you know totally fascinating, but when we think about right wing Germans, there are various uh, different kinds of motivations that govern them, and I'd like to hear a little more about the right wing Jewish socioeconomic affiliations of these figures. Zadie, yeah. 
Um, you know, I can, in this case, really only speak to, to the Shulms as my book is a biography of, of a single family, but th this is an upper middle class family and th that their, their German patriotism, I think is probably the best way of putting it, um, is coming out. I think it is somewhat descended from the national liberal tradition, but their right of center politics are clearly motivated also by economic, their personal economic concerns as, as what we would call small businessmen. They own their own business and they are certainly concerned about and, and opposed to the Social Democratic Party, which has this Marxist rhetoric, which only spikes if you, or increases at the very least at the time of the revolution and immediately thereafter. So I think that you're right, that the, that the socioeconomic aspect in this case um, cannot be ignored. And I think that it's interesting that the most conservative member of the Sholem family is the one who is more or less the leader of the family enterprise and sees himself as the guardian or the protector of the, the, the head of the, of the family business. Um, and you know, this speaks also to what we were just discussing about in Australia, that he's on the right economically in Australia, and he's a successful businessman in Australia as well, so establishing his own, his own business. So I think you're correct that there is a, a certainly an economic uh, realpolitik, if you will, strain at work here. Yeah, I want to. So I want to second that, um, and it's certainly. So I don't want to give the impression that the book also is not about class. Um, it's it's very much sort of a story of, for the right, mostly of middle and upper middle class, German Jews, um, sometimes driven by quite concrete sort of uh, economic interests, similar to ones like. Uh, Reinhard Scholem had right, small business owners, not usually sort of the old bourgeoisie sort of, uh, or, or grand capitalists, but sort of upper middle as like smaller kind of factories or, or businesses. Um, but it's also particularly for the generation that comes of age in the empire, um, sort of a, the, the Bildungsbürgertum, so not only the economic Bürgertum, but sort of the ones that disdain the lower classes for cultural and other reasons and also benefit that's particularly for the political orientation important to see in the cities they benefit from the three class voting rights right because uh, as long as they are um, which is sort of based on tax taxation basis right sort of their three class uh, classes in which you vote depending on how high your tax income is um, but the share of them the people each class sends to the city council is the same so that means that uh, lower classes have to have many more votes to get the same kind of counselors. And so if you're upper middle class, you benefit in political representation quite strongly in that system um, in a way that would disappear the moment you have the general franchise. And so a certain level of, that's what I meant before, like they like the parliament or sort of these kind of institutions, some of them, um, but they don't wanna have democratization, right? There's, a, there's certainly sort of a fear of the people. Um, and that again, sort of is not unique to them, only there's, you know, Gustave Le Bon writes the, the, about the masses, right, and the irrationality of the masses. Um, but it's not a purely economically di driven class politics, uh, but it's also cultural and, and quite often so power political class politics that maintains post, uh, so question of decorum sometimes too, uh, that maintains post 1918, 19, 19 uh, and then sometimes other resentment. Um, but yeah, but it's, cert it's most certainly, and I'll stop my very long line at answer, uh, it's very certainly also a, a, an issue of class in most of these these cases. There are very few to think of. There are very, very few who come from sort of lower middle classes. There's some, but not many. Um, okay, we have a question from Marsha um, Waldstreicher or Waldstreicher, um, uh, depending on where you are, uh, about the religiosity, uh, religious observance and, and affiliations. Um, Marsha, are, um, are you there? Oh, hello, Marsha? Yes. Yeah, Marsha, do you want to ask your question? Yes. Um, I wanted to know, based on the, um, the socioeconomic classes, if there was any religious relevance to why each group was within that socioeconomic level, um, like how observant they were, uh, what kind of education they got. Um, to what level they were and then how that impacted, obviously, what came afterward in terms of voting rights and, and their 
their position. Um, so as I, as I mentioned before, so for some of the, the characters that look at religion and religios religiosity plays an importance, it's not sort of the, the kind of observance isn't all an entirely sort of class based, right? You could find even within the same classes, different kinds of observance. So you could be a member of the liberal uh, community or of the orthodox community. I think liberal was sort of the more common one. Um, for most of the middle middle classes, if they were sort of engaged in it, but it's not a um, it's not a def definitive correlation. Um, and so, you know, I've, some actually rejected sort of the less religious upbringing of their parents and went back to for for sort of political reasons, thinking of tradition is important, belonging to a traditional community is important. Hence, they wanted to be not necessarily become orthodox, but put a put great store again. Um, in sort of a consciously religious or consciously Jewish life in a way that went further than sort of what they seem to see the liberal uh, assimilated that's also their time to use parents. Um, some were, Esther Bondi is actually one of the few few uh, women who, who appears more fully in my book, it comes from an Orthodox family, the Hirschs, um, where again sort of th that the new orthodoxy in which her family is very much sort of involved is very strong predictor of the her conservative politics because that is sort of uh, everything else is sort of unacceptable. Similarly to what I mentioned before, she's the typical sort of Israeli reader, right? So if she follows the line that if you're Orthodox then the monarchy is important uh, and everything else sort of is, is, is not acceptable in terms of traditional politics and how, how society should be organized. Um, but then you also have sort of more idiosyncratic uh, figures like Sheps, who sort of isn't conventionally religious, uh, though he's very interested in theology, um, but has a sort of mixture of secularized or historical idea about Jewish tradition with some sort of religious observance in there, um, where that plays a role. But I'd, I'd be hesitant to say that sort of a, a specific and class specific religious orientation sort of begot then a specific uh, political orientation. Um, but I think maybe Jay can also say, you know, for, for the, to show them a bit more here how that worked, because uh, I think that's always the great case where everything comes together. Yeah, I want to, you know, build on one thing that, that uh, Philip has said as well, is that when we talk about the religiosity um, and the various identities of German Jewry, one group that does often get overlooked are the neo-Orthodox. These are Jews that to our 21st century eyes would look to be what we would call modern orthodox. Um, Gershom Scholem's in-laws, or his first in-laws uh, in Hamburg, were, in, uh, the, uh, the Burchards, were in fact neo-orthodox. And these are Jews who saw themselves as very German and saw themselves as very Jewish. They had a halakhically observant lifestyle at the same time that they saw themselves as a part of the broader community and so in the case of uh, Gershom Sholem's brothers-in-law, these were Orthodox men who had university educations and they saw themselves as being a part of the German community, not in, in contradiction with their Jewish identity. And they were inclined culturally and politically to the right of, of, of center as well. So that's a group that was about 10 to 15% of the overall Jewish community in Germany at this time. I'm not saying that that 15% is coterminous with the 10% who are voting uh, right of center, not at all, but there has to be a, a notable overlap in that group. The Sholem family is a family that is almost the cliche of, of three-day Jews, of not being particularly religious, having the Christmas tree. Uh, they do rediscover their Judaism during the National, National Socialist period and become more engaged, but at the same time, they clearly think of themselves as Jewish and they, they um, while not uh, celebrating or observing Jewish holidays in a traditional manner, they have a sense of themselves as somewhat different from other, other Germans and as part of a, a community, a, a subset, a subculture within the, the broader community. Um, so th that might be an interesting aspect of religion and class in, in conversation there as well. Um, we have a, a question from Michael Lewin um, about 
uh, the post-war German Jewish community, which of course is a, you know, there, there's a small amount of continuity, but then it's also a different group. But Michael, would you like to um, uh, ask your question on the air? Are you there? Yeah, sure. I just took me a second to unmute. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask, the political alignments of the Weimar period really like, are they similar at all to how, what German Jews politics after the war? I mean, is the post-war Jewish community, for example, like also have that kind of center left orientation or more to the left or more to the right, or is there just no way of knowing because it's such a small community? I mean, Jay, you wrote your, your book uh, about post-war, so I... Uh, and you, you, did your master, I mean, you did your master's thesis on this as well. <laughs> so we're talking about a, a, a small community. We're in the neighborhood of 20,000 people. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that most of the Jews who are living in the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany, after 1949 are are uh, of Eastern European Jewish heritage, either themselves or, or the children of Eastern European Jews. There is a small number uh, in the thousands of German Jews who have, who have returned to Germany, who survived uh, in the underground, survived the camps, or survived because their spouses, particularly uh, most, most commonly wives, were not Jewish. So there is a differentiation in those groups in terms of their politics. And again, I want to say it's, it's a small group we're talking about. 20,000 people, maybe it gets up to a little under 40,000 by the late 1980s, but not enough to make a difference electorally the way in the Weimar Republic, uh, Jews could have tipped the balance in a few districts in Berlin, especially Frankfurt. So that said, uh, Jewish returnees, Jews who had emerged from the underground or Jews particularly who had non-Jewish spouses would have been probably more likely to vote conservative that is to say the Christian Democratic Union, then uh, Eastern European Jews who had gotten German citizenship. That's not to say that in an absolute sense that these Jews are, that most of those Jews are voting right of center, but they would have been more likely than other Jews to vote right, right of center, um, building on some pre-war heritages. It was hard for many of them to vote for the Free Democrats, the Liberal Party, because that became in many ways the party of choice among acceptable parties for former Nazis or really right-wing figures in, 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 the, in, the, in the Federal Republic. Uh, later, Jew, many Jews, most notably uh, Bubis, uh, are, are members of, of the Free Democrats. But you do see um, some fairly public Jewish participation in the Social Democratic Party. Um, the first three, first three, and I believe possibly the only three Jewish members of the Bundestag uh, serving from 19, in the first Bundestag period, uh, incidentally, um, who were Jewish, were social democrats. And there is a space within the, the German Social Democratic Party for the Jews, um, not necessarily religious Jews, but people who identify themselves culturally or ancestrally as Jewish. So I would say within this small group, it's disproportionately leaning towards the social democrats. And I would say that within, among those Jews who vote conservative, which is Christian Democratic Union in the post-49 period, it's disproportionately Jews of German heritage. Yeah, and, and I think sort of today, uh, since there you also said there were questions about today, so maybe we use this sort of as a, as a segue into current politics. It's a, it's a bit more varied sort of within sort of the, the general sort of democratic spectrum, but there is, I mean, and that's sort of what I find interesting. More, more recently, um, which is very much a fringe group, but, uh, uh, an organization. So there's a new right wing or far right wing party in German politics, the Alternative for Germany, which was initially founded as an anti Euro party and has since morphed into an anti immigrant um, party. That, however, in its sort of anti, particularly Muslim stance, has been trying, uh, in some areas at least, to attract the Jewish vote, um, if, even though there are also very well known instances of anti Semitism within that party. Um, and so there is actually now that was founded in Frankfurt, I believe. Uh, a subgroup of uh, Jews within that alternative for Germany, which by and large are uh, here in that sort of the most recent immigrant part of the Jewish community, um, Jews from the former Soviet Union. Uh, so that's another way for, right? So after 1990, the German Jewish community grew uh, quite strongly 
mostly, I mean, it's almost it, it quadrupled almost in members, right, from around 30,000 to 100, 120,000 officially members and or around that um, and, and sort of more that are not affiliated with the, with, uh, uh, with the official recognized sort of community um, by immigration from the former Soviet Union, um, which again sort of altered the profile of the German Jewish community. The other part of sort of a big, particularly Berlin, Jewish community you have is Israeli Jews uh, who, who live in Germany, uh, in Berlin in particular, who by and large skew left, um, which is a significant group uh, as well for uh, sort of Jewish life here in the city. You know, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that uh, a certain visible segment of the German Jewish community, especially uh, before 1990, voted for the Green Party once this became a viable option. Um, this is many of the voters think of like Micha Brumlach are Jews who were born after the Holocaust, the children of survivors, grew up in Germany, had a left of center orientation, but perhaps uh, not necessarily socialist, and had a, what can you think of as a broadly liberal outlook. And uh, they came together, Frankfurt, Frankfurt in particular, um, they coalesced around other, other others, other outsiders in the broader community, and they found a space for themselves in the green movement and went on to have um, roles as say city councilors, state legislatures uh, with, with the Green Party and that's continued. You know, um, Philip mentioned the Jews for the alternative for Germany. It's, it's a small but fascinating phenomenon and I often think it has a sort of echo of what has happened with Israeli politics also since 1990 that the massive influx of Russian speaking post-Soviet Jews to Israel has shifted the Israeli political spectrum to the right as well. Of course, in Israel, we're talking about a million post-Soviet Jews. In Germany, we're, we're, we're talking about perhaps 100,000 you know, plus or minus a few tens of thousands. Um, yeah, I would, wanted to respond to something that you said, Philip, um, that I, I think um, there's a really interesting parallel in the history that you talk about um, what you referenced the idea that um, the sort of anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant politics of the IF day um, is, um, you know, that, that somehow they feel that they can position themselves as, um, you know, friends to the Jews because the, you know, Muslims are anti-Semitic and, you know, very grossly uh, paraphrased, but, you know, I guess it is a kind of, um, course uh, understanding of things. But in any case, um, I, mean, that's, I, I think that's a really interesting parallel to the way your book talks about how Jews get used in the sort of construction of in and out groups by German nationalists. Like for instance, you know, you, you, you talk about conservative groups and uh, in World War I who, you know, sort of want to claim the Jews, even the, um, you know, not necessarily German speaking Jews in Eastern Europe has like the bulwark of, of Germandom against the Russians. Um, so I think that's an interesting parallel where that, you know, um, it's not just about the choices that the, the Jews are making, but the, the choices that, you know, these conservative political groups make um, to uh, sort of include or exclude Jews depending on how it defines their, um, uh, you know, broader ideology, whether it's nationalist or whether it's saying like, you know, actually we're sort of Western pluralists, um, you know, in, in the case of the IF day. Um, so, right, it's, it's an interesting parallel in certain ways, but then sort of the motivation I and mean, reveals a lot about, you know, the history of German and German speaking Jewry in the 20th century, that in the first instance, it's really, it's, it's a numbers game, right? So they endorse in, during the first world war or before having German speaking speaking or you're just speaking Jews sort of as proto-Germans in the East gives you a fairly large population uh, that you might want to claim as beholden or, right. or otherwise to your politics. Whereas now when the AfD is doing it, they're not because they're really expecting a lot of voters, but within the memory politics of Germany and the German yeah. political landscape, right, it is, they, they realize with all sort of the anti-immigrant rhetoric that they can only really get away with it, which also tells you about sort of what kind of anti-immigrant rhetoric is in, okay, in Germany if at the same time they don't appear anti-Semitic, right? So if they can say, uh, but we are really defenders of Jews. And actually it's, a, it's an interesting parallel here that the AfD tries to position itself as the strongest supporter of 
Israel in that context too within the German political landscape um, and sort of completely dismissive of any Palestinian rights, right? Sort of um, similar to the way that maybe Orban is doing it or the Kajiski is doing I mean, there's a sort of, there is a far right support for um, on sort of anti-Muslim, ethno sometimes ethnocratic grounds too, right? Sort of that, that plays out. But in the German case, clearly it's strategic um, as well, right? So to say, uh, we learned, if they, I mean, some want to say that, we learned some lessons, right? We're not, we're not the Nazis. Right. So like Jews, uh, we're just anti-Muslim, right? And the Jews are part of Germany, that we learned, right? We learned that part of history. And they speak about, you know, that's something longer term since 1945, really, uh, so sort of the, the Judeo-Christian uh, um, legacy now that sort of uh, supposedly uh, is like the basis for. for yeah. Um, so that maybe is a good segue to uh, one of the uh, questions about contemporary um, uh, parallels, uh, you know, particularly in America and Israel. So uh, Jeffrey Kahn actually asked the question first um, about an hour ago. So Jeffrey, if you're still there, um, let me... Uh, oh, yep, he's got his hand up. Um, Jeffrey, are you there? You just have to unmute yourself. I've um, I've given you uh, permission to talk. We'll, get, we'll give him one more chance. Yeah. Oh, hi, Jeffrey, you're there. Yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, well, I think you've answered some of the questions, but... Uh, I, I wonder if you can make any comparisons uh, to what's happened to uh, so, some uh, political directions of the Jewish community in uh, both in America and Israel in terms of veering more towards the right, uh, uh, especially uh, I want to see if we can make any comparisons in terms of the fear of the influence of the left and anti-Semitism on the left, uh, which produces this veer towards the right. Uh, specifically, let's say, like in, in in the last elections two years ago, and even today, we see more and more uh, Democrats on the left, young people on the left, winning their seats and espousing uh, anti-Semitism, uh, anti-Israel remarks, and so you see more and more Jews uh, turning to the right. So I'm wondering if you can make any comparisons to uh, what happened in Germany at the time after the war, after World War I, in terms of fear of communism, in, fear of, in terms of that. Okay, uh, thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, Jay or Philip? I can, so there was certainly sort of a class-based fear or certain fear of sort of communism uh, among some middle-class and upper middle-class German Jews as, as for non-German Jews. But it was mostly not because they were fearing an anti-Semitism coming from the left, but sort of an anti-Semitic backlash from the right in response to that revolution. Right? So the fear was, for by and large in Weimar was not that it might be some anti-Semitism from the left. If, if anything, really the social Democrats were uh, the the most open defenders of Jews sort of as a, sort of the, one of the few openly anti-anti-Semitic uh, political party in Germany. Um, and the communists are slightly more complicated, but, but they too sort of in their agnostic uh, and had, had, many, had many Jews among them or had Jews among them. Um, in Vada Sholem Yus'i, right, is, uh, is one example for that who, who doesn't necessarily fall over his sort of Jewish background in the communist party for other political reasons. Um, I, th I think, what it does, what we can maybe see from the from the history more broadly is that so sort of our our instinctive association or instinctive is wrong, but sort of the often drawn association that Jews naturally have to be on the left um, for you know civic rights reasons, etc., right? because that's the history of emancipation might be more complicated. Giving sort of considering other circumstances, conservative politics might have an, an as strong appeal. Uh, or a strong appeal for them to, um, I don't hesitate to draw too, too narrow parallels to what happen, what's happening in, in the 20s to what's happening um, today. I think Jay has any other thoughts on this? No, I, I, would, uh, I would concur. And I think that one of the central factors that's in conversation today was completely out of the conversation at the time, which is, which is Israel and, and Zionism. Um, 
and that many American Jews uh, today um, feel um, somewhat um, uh, at a loss or at, at, at sea because they feel like uh, one side is um, critical of Zionism and Israel in a way that they don't share those views, but they think the other side is not critical enough of anti-Semitism or rhetoric that can be construed as anti-Semitism. So that's a it's a different a different phenomenon from what what we're talking about at the time of the Revolution, German Civil War, and, and its aftermath. And I think Philip's completely right that that there are that we see this quite frequently in the archives and in memoirs that many Jews who themselves were not socialists and may or may not have been democratic, but were liberal at this time, were concerned about not anti-Semitism on the left, but about the left's disproport the, the disproportionate share of Jews on the German left at the time of 1918, 1919, 1920, spa spawning a backlash from the right. So it's, uh, you know, of course it was the Jews who, you know, Eisner was a Jew and Levine was a Jew and what will this mean for us? So that upper middle class, not to speak of just upper class Jews who were center or perhaps center right or even center left are concerned about the left and the far left and the Jewish role in those at the time of the revolution. So um, I think these are distinct phenomena, in fact. Yes. Well, it's almost uh, 3.30, so um, I think we're gonna uh, close there. But I wanna say thank you to Jay Geller and Philip Nielsen so much for joining us. Um, We've posted the links to both their books and um, also a link to support LBI's programming. And we'll send you a note about that after this to all, to all the participants. But thank you, Jay. Thank you, Philip. Philip, uh, have a nice evening, Jay. Nice afternoon. Uh, it, was, it was great to, to hear from you, a really fascinating discussion. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Thank you for our.